Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be on a valvular heart lesion of aortic regurgitation in which I'll be mainly focusing on the pathophysiology of it. So I'm going to be discussing aortic regurgitation from a clinical viewpoint, obviously. So let's mind map today's topic. Under clinical examination, we have auscultation in which we have a lot of different murmurs of which diastolic murmurs form a big chunk of it in which aortic regurgitation is one of the most important causes of diastolic murmurs apart from obviously the mid diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis and the early diastolic murmur of pulmonary regurgitation. So when we come in um, aortic regurgitation, I'm going to be dealing with pathophysiology alone today. The other details of how exactly the murmur sounds and where to auscultate it, that will be dealt with in another video. So today's questions for active recall are going to be these six questions. So look at them, try to answer them on your own before embarking on this video. What are the etiologies of aortic regurgitation? Now, it's broadly classified into two types. One is the aortic valvular level, and second is the aortic root level of causes. And under valvular causes, we have rheumatic heart disease, which affects the aortic valve. This is the commonest cause in India and in the Indian subcontinent. And usually when aortic valve is affected, there is almost always affection of the mitral valve as well. Then there is bicuspid aortic valve, wherein uh, the bicuspid aortic valve associated aortic valve regurgitation or aortic stenosis can occur. And in some 10 to 15 percent, there is pure aortic regurgitation. Then there is infective endocarditis, which affects the aortic valve leaflets. It, it is more commonly uh, known to affect uh, diseased leaflets like what is seen in bicuspid aortic valve. So that's a common association. Then trauma obviously can lead to damage to the aortic valve. It can lead to rupture of the uh, valve leaflets and lead to acute aortic regurgitation. Important cause of AR is ventricular septal defect. Now, these defects are not very large, so they literally go unnoticed unless you auscultate for a murmur of the small sized VSD. Usually, these VSDs are subpulmonic, sometimes subaortic VSDs. And what happens is the aortic cusps lack support because of the presence of this VSD because it's so close to the aortic cusps. So usually there's a prolapse of the right coronary cusp or the non-coronary cusp usually and that leads to progressive aortic regurgitation. So it begins usually after 10 years of age and it keeps progressing and in the first or the second decade the patient gets progressive aortic regurgitation and signs of volume overload. So that's an important cause. What are the other uh, various causes which arise from the aortic root? So there's cystic medial necrosis of the aorta uh, in which the elastic tissue of the aortic uh, wall gets affected and it may or may not be associated with a clinically uh, syndromic obvious Marfan syndrome. Then there is aortic aneurysm which may be because of atherosclerosis or because of this cystic medial necrosis. Then an aneurysm of the sinus of Valsalva, that itself can also again affect the coaptation of the aortic valve. Syphilis is a rare cause. It's not that common these days. Then aortic di dissection by various mechanisms can lead to aortic regurgitation. The flap interferes with the coaptation of the aortic leaflets usually. And there are, uh, there are a host of rare causes like ankylosing spondylitis, Ritter syndrome, and osteogenesis imperfecta. What are the causes of functional aortic regurgitation? Now, functional means there is no intrinsic valve defect. So the valve is structurally normal. But certain conditions like severe hypertension, chronic anemia, or patients who are on renal dialysis do demonstrate evidence of some amount of functional aortic regurgitation. So why does this happen? When there is a vascular volume or pressure overload, that is, there is volume or pressure overload within the aortic root, then it leads to aortic ring dilatation, le leading to lack of coaptation of the leaflets, and it leads to a central aortic regurgitation jet. So obviously, severe hypertension leads to a pressure overload of the aorta. Uh, chronic anemia and uh, uh, patients who are on renal dialysis can also can lead to volume overload. And sometimes those who are on dialysis, because of the associated severe hypertension, can lead to a combination of both volume as well as pressure overload. 
Now we know that the murmur which is heard in aortic regurgitation is a diastolic murmur. But the question is, why is this diastolic murmur of AR decrescendo? So what happens is there is backward flow of blood from the aorta to the left ventricle right from the beginning of diastole. And the event which just precedes this leakage is the second heart sound and more precisely A2 that is closure of the aortic valve. So at the end of systole you get A2 to signal the end of systole and then later on since that valve leaflet is not working well the valve starts leaking and hence there's a backward flow. So it begins, so this murmur begins with A2. Now, an important point to note is this particular pressure curve diagram. So we have the LV pressure curve in black and you have the aortic pressure curve in blue. So if you see, this is the entire diastolic period. This is the systolic peak, the A2 has occurred but now the valve is not working so it has started leaking so if you notice at the beginning of this diastole the aortic diastolic pressure is very high right and then it starts becoming less and less as we go towards the end of diastole simultaneous to the high aortic pressure diastolic pressure the lv pressure is almost zero or just a little bit above zero. So there's a huge gradient, high pressure gradient between the aortic pressure in diastole and the LV pressure in early diastole. As a result, this large gradient leads to turbulence and it leads to a high frequency blowing murmur, which is a diastolic murmur. But later on, as we continue in diastole, this diastolic gradient continues to fall in the rest of the diastole and hence you get a classic decrescendo murmur. Let's get an idea of the hemodynamics of aortic regurgitation. So what is the response of left ventricle to volume overload condition of chronic aortic regurgitation? So what happens is in AR there is volume overload. The LV has to face the regurgitant blood from the AR as well as the mitral inflow blood. All of this happens in diastole. As a result, the LV enlarges in size. So that sets off a frank stalling effect. What does that mean? Dilatation gives rise to more stretch of the LV, which increases the contractility and stroke volume. When there is an increase in the total stroke volume from the LV, and this is a normal response because of this frank stalling effect, it increases the systolic blood pressure. As we realize, if we go in the prior question, the highest pressure that was seen in the aorta was almost 150 millimeters of mercury. However, at the same time, there is compensatory peripheral vasodilatation in order for tissue perfusion to take place. Since so much of blood, because of regurgitation, is going back in the LV, tissue perfusion can get affected. In fact, it does get affected when it becomes very severe. So there is a compensatory peripheral vasodilatation for allowing some blood to go ahead instead of leaking behind. As a result, this contributes to lowering of the diastolic blood pressure. Hence, we get increased pulse pressure because the systolic blood pressure is increased and the diastolic blood pressure is decreased. And when you subtract diastolic blood pressure from systolic blood pressure, you get a high pulse pressure. How does the left ventricle compliance change with volume overload in chronic aortic regurgitation? Now, this is based on one of the important laws in cardiology called the Laplace's law, in which the wall tension in the left ventricle is equal to the pressure across the ventricular wall into the radius of the left ventricle divided by the ventricular wall thickness. So what happens in early chronic AR, early stages, is that LV has to dilate in response to so much volume overload. Hence, its radius increases. Now, the very fact that the LV is dilating in response to the volume, it means that the LV is certainly not stiff or non-compliant in its early stages. So the compliance of LV is preserved. However, as per Laplace's law, increasing radius leads to increasing wall tension or wall stress. So because of this increased wall tension, there is increased myocardial oxygen demand. And because of the oxygen mismatch between 
oxygen demand and supply it leads to exertional angina the patient may have normal coronaries but yet because of the increased demand it leads to angina additionally because of the increased wall tension the lv again tries to compensate by undergoing hypertrophy so it tries to increase the wall thickness however this hypertrophy is not the concentric hypertrophy that you see in a typical case of severe aortic stenosis in which the muscle wall is really thickened so this hypertrophy here in chronic aortic regurgitation is eccentric type in which the myocardial fibers are laid down in series not in parallel so this compensatory hypertrophy doesn't really compensate for this increased wall tension and as a result over time the left ventricle becomes stiff which is to say that the compliance of the left ventricle finally starts reducing as a result what it means is when you have reduced compliance that means the lv is not ready or is not willing to receive blood in diastole it is it is given up it's received too much blood already in because of this chronic severe ar and it comes to a point when it says i'm done so what happens is the lv starts raising its own diastolic pressures which were till now quite normal in the early stages so once it raises its lv diastolic pressure this interferes with subendocardial perfusion leading to myocardial necrosis and replacement fibrosis and overall in response to these raised diastolic pressures there's raised la pressure which obviously contributes to dyspnea on exertion now this is going to be the crux of today's video wherein you have to compare the hemodynamics of acute ar versus chronic compensated ar versus chronic decompensated ar so i'll begin with acute aortic regurgitation these are just explanatory diagrams uh, which uh, this this shows the left ventricle and this is the aorta and i've shown some numbers here to explain the concept in a better way and these are the various pressure waveforms this black waveform is the left ventricular waveform the dark blue is aortic and the light blue is the left atrial waveform so what happens to the left ventricle when it faces a sudden acute increase in volume overload uh, during diastole the left ventricle is essentially non compliant because it is not used to this sudden increase in the blood volume as opposed to for example chronic aortic regurgitation the left ventricular volume is normal and uh, its uh, size is also normal and it is a non dilated left ventricle so when there is a sudden acute ar which can happen with say a sudden rupture of a valve because of infective endocarditis or trauma then the left ventricle is caught unawares it is surprised by the sudden volume so it doesn't have time to dilate in order to accommodate this extra blood and since it doesn't dilate its forward outflow is also not much so its stroke volume is reduced and the stroke volume which is the uh, overall total stroke volume because it gets reduced the systemic or the systolic blood pressure is low now because the systolic blood pressure is low the pulse pressure is either normal or it is just mildly widened and this is quite opposite to what we see in chronic aortic regurgitation now because this left ventricle has been caught unawares it is non compliant this sudden increase in volume raises its left ventricular end diastolic pressure and this is what we see here in this pressure curve is that there's a rise in the diastolic pressures and this left ventricular end diastolic pressure point is raised so what happens as a result is a very unique thing of acute ar in which the aortic diastolic and the lv diastolic pressures start approximating this doesn't happen in chronic compensated ar the lv diastolic pressures rise so much that they in fact overshoot the left atrial pressures and this is what happens the lv diastolic pressures become greater than la diastolic pressures so there's a reverse lv to la gradient which leads to premature closure of the mitral valve remember this is the diastole the mitral valve is supposed to be opened but when you have a gradient which is opposite instead of a gradient being from la to lv here the gradient reverses because of a sudden acute surge in the lv diastolic pressures and hence it leads to premature closure of mitral valve and it leads to what is known as functional mitral stenosis of course as a result of this acute 
sudden hemodynamic change, there is compensatory tachycardia, which serves to increase the overall cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume into heart rate. And since the stroke volume is reduced, the heart rate is increased in order to compensate for it. Also, tachycardia helps to reduce the regurgitation time because as we know, when the heart rate increases, it does so at the cost of diastole and regurgitation in acute AR or any kind of AR is of course diastolic. So this is just an example. This LV is normal sized. Here there are some numbers which essentially shows a normal uh, LV with normal ejection fraction because there's nothing really wrong with the LV at the beginning or at the baseline. But when you, uh, when you minus the end systolic volume, which is 50 ml from the end diastolic volume, you get a stroke volume of 90 milliliter. However, this is normal. However, 50 milliliter of it is regurgitating because of acute AR. So as a result, the forward stroke volume is extremely low, which is 40 ml. As a result, the systolic blood pressure is low. Now we come to what happens in chronic compensated AR, which is the usual AR that we see clinically in clinically stable patients. Again, same illustrations as before, except that they'll be different in terms of what we find. The left ventricular volume obviously increases when you have slow chronic aortic regurgitation. And that means that the LV volume is compliant in the initial stages because it is still a compensated aortic regurgitation. So because the LV dilates in order to accumulate this extra blood regurgitating back in diastole, the forward stroke volume overall is maintained and the total stroke volume increases because it accommodates extra blood. For example, here, the end diastolic volume has now increased to 250 and systolic volume is 50. Overall ejection fraction is very good. In fact, it's increased. It's 80% in order to compensate for this extra volume. And uh, when, you, when you subtract 50 from 250, you get 200 as the total stroke volume of which say around 100 comes back because of aortic regurgitation. And the net forward stroke volume is in fact very good. Remember in acute AR, the forward stroke volume was just 40 ml, which is very less. And normally it should be around 670 uh, ml or so. And here the forward stroke volume is more than normal. Now, as a result, uh, because this, systolic blood pressure is maintained because the stro forward stroke volume is maintained the systolic blood pressure is high and as a result the pulse pressure is going to be high here we can see this is the pulse pressure the aortic pressure is also 150 over here now because it's a compliant left ventricle it has had time to compensate redilate its left ventricular end diastolic pressure is normal so it is not steeply rising high and as a result, the aortic and the LV diastolic pressures do not approximate as what was seen with acute aortic regurgitation. Finally, in chronic decompensated AR, what happens is it undergoes a progressive decline. What undergoes a decline is first the LV function. It has been facing so much volume overload for such a long period of time that the LV now starts failing and the overall forward stroke volume has, uh, starts declining. The LV further dilates and it tries to accommodate more volume, but that does not serve it well. So, for example, the end diastolic volume is 300, which is increased further, but the end systolic volume has also now started increasing to the extent of 150. So, the stroke volume is 300 minus 150, which is 150 cc of total stroke volume. However, the net forward stroke volume is only 60 cc because of regurgitation. So this is still less. When the LV, LV dysfunction becomes much more advanced, then this total stroke volume drops even more. And as a result, the pulse pressure that time reduces. So initially, the pulse pressure may still be increased in the early stages. But with advancing LV dysfunction, the pulse pressure starts dropping as the system systolic blood pressure also starts dropping. Now, because this is a failing left ventricle, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure starts rising. And this quite kind of looks like the pressure curves of acute AR where the aorta and the LV pressures in diastole have now started approximating. The difference importantly is, however, in acute AR, the BP is never so high. The blood pressure is never so high. Acute AR will always show a low blood pressure of 100 or below. 
also when the lv dysfunction is much more advanced that time also the blood pressure will dro drop but in the early stages it can still show a higher systolic blood pressure so in conclusion i have compared and contrasted all these three situations by way of the same table on the same page so that you can have a quick glance at the three differences of the three phases of aortic regurgitation acute ar non compliant lv volume is normal non dilated so stroke volume is reduced systolic blood pressure is low chronic compensated it's a compliant lv forward stroke volume is maintained and systolic blood pressure is increased chronic decompensated ar lv function has started declining forward stroke volume is decreased and the lv is further dilating overall in terms of pulse pressure acute ar pulse pressure is nearly normal here the pulse pressure is wide or elevated again in chronic decompensated initially it's elevated and later it can get reduced as the lv dysfunction advances the aortic and lv diastolic pressures approximate in acute ar and in chronic decompensated ar and most importantly in acute ar there is a reverse lv to la gradient which leads to premature closure of the mitral valve tachycardia is a very important finding in acute ar which which is compensatory the lv aortic and lv diastolic pressures do not approximate in chronic compensated ar in terms of left ventricular and diastolic pressure it is increased in acute ar because the lv is non compliant it is increased in chronic decompensated ar because lv has now started failing in chronic compensated it is normal there's a question that you are bound to ask which is now that the pathophysiology is understood how do i spot a ar murmur well you will have to watch it in the next video but this was an important video because of this one word pathophysiology once you know why things happen they are pretty easy to spot and i just made up that quote but it's true once you know the pathophysiology it becomes very easy to spot these lesions clinically so like always like share subscribe comment and press the bell icon and i'll see you next time with another video